Latitude Media, podcast at the frontier of climate technology. Renewables are now super cheap and abundant. We could install nearly a half terawatt of new wind and solar capacity this year, more than the entire capacity of China, with solar representing a third of those new projects. But with that surge comes a set of very pointed questions. What do we do with all those clean electrons on grids that don't always value them and can't always handle them? I'm Stephen Lacey. I'm the executive editor at Latitude Media. And this is The Latitude, dispatches from the new frontiers of climate technology. Each week, we bring you stories from our journalists and columnists reporting at the commercial edge of the energy transition. Today, how to make good use of all those new renewable electrons hitting the grid. The Latitude is brought to you by Scale Microgrids. Scale Microgrids partners with developers, consultants, distributors, and more to discover and develop impactful, cost-optimal, and resilient energy projects across the U.S. Scale is investing hundreds of millions of dollars into distributed energy resources, providing asset-based financing for projects under development, as well as capital to developers or companies seeking to build out distributed energy and energy infrastructure project pipelines. Scale does more than generate sustainable and reliable power. Ultimately, they generate change. Partner with them at scalemicrogrids.com. And don't miss out on Transition AI brought to you by our team at Latitude Media. The market for artificial intelligence in the energy sector will likely surpass $13 billion in the next five years. The tech is moving fast, and Transition AI is the premier event charting how it will shape utilities, renewables and storage developers, energy traders, and EV charging integrators. Transition AI New York is a one-day conference and workshop in Manhattan on October 19th. It's going to feature top experts from Microsoft, GE Digital, AES, National Grid, Oracle, and a range of founders, executives, and academics who are building AI strategies right now. Get your ticket at transition-ai.com or go ahead and follow the link in the show notes. Lisa Martine Jenkins, editor of Latitude Media. Hey there. Hey, Stephen. The new site is live. I know. I can't believe it. (laughs) Now, most people take vacations over the summer. They relax a little bit. That is not what happened here with our team. Not even slightly. We have been hard at work. Um, It's a small but mighty team getting this site together. Yeah, I think it's helpful to take a step back and talk about what we're covering and why. Um, So there's a letter from the editors that folks will see in our new newsletter and on the website Latitude Media that went out. And it talks about why we're picking the spots that we are. And so you and I have covered this space for a long time. And I can remember when I started covering this space in the mid-2000s, it was this inflection point when a lot of Wall Street firms were really taking renewables seriously. There was a ton of venture capital coming into this space and wind and solar and batteries. And everyone was trying to figure out what the business models would be. And there were a lot of failures. You know, tons of companies went bankrupt. Um, We saw massive policy changes, a lot of money that was very well spent, a lot of money that was lost. But ultimately, we came to a place where renewables continued to march forward. Uh, We saw radical cost declines. And here we are where grids are being saturated with renewables and batteries are really taking off. And so folks have generally figured out what is working there. And now the question is, how do we make those renewables as valuable as possible? Because there are decent amount of renewables that are going to waste and getting curtailed. Um, And it's really hard to build out new projects or backlogs of interconnection pipelines. And there's also interest in stuff like carbon removal and hydrogen and figuring out how to make best use of those renewable electrons. So, you know, what kind of coverage have we been putting together in those new areas where investors are starting to put their money like they did in the early days of renewables and batteries? Well, our our coverage is kind of broken into three sections. The first is on digital tech. So that's where you have the pieces on AI, but also on data and analytics and data centers in the cloud. Those are the technologies that can really help the energy system scale at the rate that's required. We're also talking about technologies like the grid, like grid tech, which will be focused on grid edge technologies. So everything that is going to essentially make the grid get to where it needs to go. So we're talking about virtual power plants. We're talking about microgrids, electrification, mobility, everything that 
is sort of caught up in what the grid is going to look like 10, 20 years from now. And the third section is on emerging tech. So that's obviously a really broad category, but initially we're going to be focused on hydrogen, long duration energy storage, and carbon removal. So these are the technologies that have real potential and there's real enthusiasm about them, but they're definitely not commercialized yet. And it's kind of the second generation of climate tech. Yeah, and folks who have followed this space for a long time might be familiar with some of the coverage, like virtual power plants and renewable energy integration and you know the, the digitization layer that will make renewables optimized on the grid. Those are areas that folks have been paying more attention to, but that have become like extremely important and far more sophisticated. And that's why we're covering AI as well, because the AI-infused layer to all of that is suddenly changing the game for what we can do with these power plants. But of course, we're running into challenges with traditional energy infrastructure and the way utilities integrate this stuff. And so many of the challenges at the grid edge will be familiar with people who are building companies trying to get innovative technologies into the power grid. Um, and, and, and we're going to be covering all of that with a new flair of some of the emerging tech in that space. And then the emerging tech that you identify, which is like harder infrastructure, carbon removal, engineered carbon removal in particular, and hydrogen, there's a lot of government investment going into those spaces, and there's increasing amount of private investment. And we definitely expect to see a bunch of technology shake out, companies succeed, companies fail, projects not work out the way they are supposed to. And we want to come into this space and try to cover it in a clear-headed, rational way, knowing that these technologies will very likely ultimately succeed. The question is when and who will be the winners. Yeah, I mean, I think the distinction really is between the technologies that are proven, like wind and solar. Those are those are commercialized. There are obviously transmission backlogs and complications, but we're really focused on the unproven technologies, the ones that have a huge potential but don't necessarily have a clear glide path. So when people go on latitudemedia.com, you, they'll find a dozen pieces there now. We'll have a bunch more coverage we've been working on that's going to get rolled out, and then they can expect regular weekly, daily news coverage. And that brings us to this piece from Emma Faringer Merchant. She is one of our contributors. And we chose this story for our first dispatch because it speaks to many of the trends that we're going to be covering at the latitude. Now that renewables are cheap and dominant, we need to make good use of them in order to maximize their potential to lower emissions. And And that brings us to the intersection of many of the things we'll be covering, like grid infrastructure, long-duration storage, hydrogen, carbon removal, et cetera. So now, here is Lisa reading a piece from contributor Emma Ferenger merchant This is The Excess Renewables Opportunity by Emma Ferenger merchant In an agricultural community in California's Central Valley, huge bricks of clay juiced to more than 1,000 degrees Celsius use the state's ample midday solar supply to provide steam to an ethanol plant. In Ireland, a nonprofit relies on excess wind energy to power water heaters overnight in state subsidized housing. And at a Belgian port, a green hydrogen plant is in the works that will use spare wind electricity produced offshore. These projects, and others like them, are designed to make use of renewable electricity at times of day when the grid is flush with it. They take advantage of a resource that would otherwise be wasted. The potential for such projects has increased in recent years as wind and solar installations ballooned in number. Though natural gas still accounts for most U.S. generation, renewable energy has made up the majority of new additions to the grid since 2019. In many locations, new renewable installations now provide electricity at costs lower than fossil fuels. In some markets, this dynamic has already led to a surplus of clean electricity at certain times of day. Long-duration storage is still too nascent to absorb it all, though energy modeling experts expect it to play a vital role in the decarbonized grid of the coming decades. In the meantime, project developers are increasingly considering how to avoid wasting electricity produced when there's not enough demand for it. It's something that is on the mind of every developer, said Elif Ashante, Senior Director of Technical Services at Avangrid Renewables, one of the largest owners of renewable energy projects in the U.S. And, if done right, this could spur decarbonization in new industries. Today, curtailment happens just 1.5 to 4 percent of the time in many significant renewables markets, according to the International Energy Agency but it will become more commonplace as even more renewables are deployed. Modeling shows that curtailment levels usually land somewhere between 5 and 20 percent in a least cost, fully clean system, said Brian Taroja, an energy systems researcher at University of California Irvine's Advanced Power and Energy Program. 
The goal isn't often to eliminate all curtailment, but it's to keep the levels of curtailment from getting out of hand, he said. Achieving that goal is expected to become more challenging. Experts at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the International Energy Agency expect that overbuilding wind and solar is the cheapest and most flexible way to build a decarbonized grid, which can then rely on storage to help with intermittency. But the hurdle also presents an opportunity, finding uses for all that extra electricity. To some extent, the issue of oversupply is of our own making. More and better grid connections would allow developers to send excess electricity further afield, balancing it across wider geographies than the current grid allows. But transmission backlogs have become a notorious snag for developers as more projects crowd the grid. So companies are having to get creative. When there's not enough transmission to get that energy to market, it's bad for the generators, it's bad for the customers, it's bad for everybody, said Sheldon Kimber, CEO of Intersect Power, which owns solar and storage projects in California and Texas. Batteries are the obvious choice for developers aiming to ease congestion and shift renewable capacity to other times of day. But today's storage options, largely lithium-ion batteries, which have about a four-hour storage maximum and are also in demand for electric vehicles, can only soak up so much electricity, and long-duration batteries remain too expensive for widespread use. Addressing those challenges is baked into the business plan for Intersect, said Kimber, as it looks to connect its projects to specific demands rather than general power contracts. We need to be trying to focus on making products, if you will, whether it be a data packet or a molecule of hydrogen or a molecule of ammonia, said Kimber. If you do that, you put yourself in a much more flexible position because you've got these on-site uses that will use all the energy that you produce. Kimber believes six technologies have the most promise for using the coming flood of cheap renewable electricity. Desalination, data centers, fuels like green hydrogen, direct air capture, widespread EV charging, and heat energy for heavy industry. That latter area is a large focus for Rondo, the company behind the brick battery at the California ethanol plant. Manufacturing steel, cement, and chemicals requires high heat, which today comes mostly from fossil fuels. Rondo projects heat bricks during the day when solar electricity is plentiful, then discharge them when a factory needs to power its kilns. In the future, the startup is considering linking up to wind and solar projects behind the meter, potentially speeding up renewables projects that have long been mired in a lengthy interconnection backlog. It's one of the big, great development opportunities of our time for developers who have projects that they want to build that are just stuck, said Rondo CEO John O'Donnell, who previously worked at Glasspoint, a concentrated solar power developer. Avangrid, too, is exploring behind-the-meter applications for excess renewables, but is focused on areas that it views as simpler to interconnect. For instance, in the last several months, Avangrid has bid its extra generation from projects in the Pacific Northwest into the Western energy imbalance market to send it to areas of higher demand, which has helped the developer reduce curtailments there. Consumption is often not in the places where the renewable generators are, said Brian Faist, Avangrid's vice president of renewable origination. Anything that can align consumption or load with generation is the key to avoiding congestion, curtailment, and allowing more renewable energy on the grid. Faced and Shante said Avangrid has also been working to promote EVs and the production of green hydrogen, which can be used both for fuel cells that produce electricity and as a liquid fuel. Last October, the developer announced a joint agreement with utility holding company Sempra to explore the development of large-scale green hydrogen projects. They haven't yet announced any commercial projects. Charging vehicles and producing green hydrogen, depending on its end use, are among the most efficient ways to use excess renewable energy, according to Taroha, who co-authored a 2019 paper on how to prioritize end uses for excess renewables to minimize costs and maximize reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Any use designed to absorb extra renewable electricity should be evaluated on three elements, Taroha said. Its efficiency, the climate impact of the energy the electricity would replace, and the flexibility of the load that it powers. Electric vehicles do well on all three, depending on the charging scheme used. In a 2023 paper modeling flexible EV charging, researchers showed that utility-controlled charging could decrease emissions from charging by 7% versus unrestricted charging. As more Americans buy EVs, charging all those batteries has the potential to strain the grid. But if drivers opt into smart charging, they could instead provide an outlet for surplus renewables. In the future, vehicle-to-grid technologies could even allow drivers to discharge batteries at times of high demand. Assuming, that is, the drivers are willing to occasionally give up control of their batteries for the good of the grid, which Taroha said is an open question at this point. Utility interest could also pose barriers for the vehicle-to-grid adoption, which is long lagged. Meanwhile, green hydrogen is perhaps the buzziest technology angling to absorb the glut of renewable generation, based on a flood of interest from utilities and developers. Like Avangrid, Intersect has invested in collaborations in the space. 
In 2021, the company joined up with startup Electric Hydrogen to promote renewable hydrogen projects, though none have been publicly announced since. As of May, developers worldwide had announced more than 1,000 hydrogen projects, according to a Hydrogen Council assessment. These represent $320 billion in investments through 2030. 91 of those projects are slated to use renewable energy, which would produce the most climate-friendly type of hydrogen. Both Intersect and Avangrid said they consider climate impact when selecting technologies to optimize the use of electricity from their projects. But money is also a big factor. Avoiding curtailment is reason enough for some to consider these projects, but further incentives could encourage more movement. For instance, Kimber noted the need for market mechanisms to compensate longer-duration storage technologies to spur more developer interest in those applications. The development community is conservative by nature, so it will take some clear financial benefits before many companies make a habit of foregoing traditional power purchase agreements to make use of excess renewables. Project owners can lose revenue when energy is curtailed, but some contract types still generate returns when supply exceeds demand, said Nelson Seedham, an energy storage analyst at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And detailed modeling allows developers to estimate how often curtailments are likely to happen, which can then be baked into power purchase price. Though contract agreements vary, curtailments would most likely have to be significant and unexpected to cut into the bottom line, or the prospect of new industries must be enticing enough to encourage investment. Today, Faced at Avangrid still sees transmission build-out as the most significant solution to reducing curtailment. Kimber, though, thinks waiting for that type of fix is a risk. Avoiding, or at least limiting the impact of regulatory constraints, he said, could bring about an impactful solution more quickly. There is no Eisenhower-style massive build-out of transmission coming to save us. The Latitude is hosted by me, Stephen Lacey, and Lisa Jenkins. Our engineers are Sean Marquand and Roy Campanella III. The theme song was composed by Sean Marquand. If you like what you hear, go to latitudemedia.com to read all our stories and sign up for our newsletter and get all of our stories in your inbox. Or follow us on LinkedIn for editorial updates. Thanks to Scale Microgrids for supporting the show. Scale Microgrids is the distributed energy company dedicated to transforming the way modern energy infrastructure is designed, constructed, and financed. And this is The Latitude, dispatches from the new frontiers of climate technology. Climate technology.